Hi, thank you for coming and welcome to our session, The Future of Cloud, Building with Stateless Infrastructure on Amazon EC2. My name is Mikhail Prudnikov, and I'm a solutions architect with Amazon Web Services. And here on stage, I'm pleased to have Gene Stevens, a co-founder and the chief technology officer at ProtectWise, and Robert Terrell, director of DevOps at ProtectWise. ProtectWise is an advanced technology partner with Amazon Web Services, and its product, the ProtectWise Grid, uh, provides network visibility and the detection of complex threats that develop over time. That's, that's the key here. So the premise that sparked the idea of today's talk was that the cloud enables companies to innovate at an increasing pace and rate and much faster bring products to the market. Uh, the products that take on very complex problems and deal with massive data sets that only keep larger and larger with time. However, however, there are sets of ideas and some kind of operational practices that need to be followed to maintain and support that uh, innovation, uh, innovation pace as the company grows and scales uh, their, uh, its infrastructure. So today, we wanted to talk about some of the ideas and some of the operational practices, as well as demonstrate how ProtectWise implemented them in real life. So let's get started. Um, we'll, we, we're going to cover mutable versus immutable infrastructure, talk about implementation tips, uh, cover inf uh, in immutable infrastructure at scale, and as well address topics on delivery, cost optimization, and scaling. So, while there is a strict definition of immutability, which is once an object is created, it cannot be modified, if we apply the concept to the cloud uh, and to, to the infrastructure, then many people actually vary at the level at which they, they apply it to. Some, some stop with, with the servers being immutable, others go to whole application stacks being immutable, including the VPCs that uh, those, uh, th that application stack lives in. However, however, what's important is that the ideas, the ideas and properties that people are trying to achieve with that design, they actually there are three. So one, uh, the first property is repeatability. Once I know how to create my object, I can do it over and over again. And that is extremely important as we scale our infrastructure. The second principle is statelessness. Once we have uh, immutable object, and there is some, some kind of state associated, uh, it means that that state is managed elsewhere. It's managed outside of that immutable object. And once we assume that we have those two properties, uh, repeatability and statelessness, it means that essentially by extension, our infrastructure also has this property of uh, disposability. It means that we know how to build it, and then we can actually tear it down and recreate it when we need it. Totally opposite of it is uh, everyone's darling pet server. And you know how it starts. It's very easy to start. You, you just spin up the server, install software, and um, configure it. And then as, as, as the time goes on, you start modifying things, uh, tweaking configs here and there. There you go. You start getting configuration drifts. And the problem with that, not only you lose track of what's going on with your instance, it's very hard to actually implement this approach at scale. Not only this concept of pet servers, it applies to, um, to servers. If you look at, let's say, somebody creating a VPC manually, or adding a security group here and security rule there, like, there you go, you just created an equivalent of a pet server, but inside your larger infrastructure. Another one is people like to, to give names to, um, to their pets. And that's, that's a little bit hard because once you hit the server count like around 200, you start running out of ideas. And one way to actually mitigate this approach, it's, it's a concept of Phoenix, Phoenix servers and Phoenix infrastructure. And I really like this analogy. Uh, the, term uh, was, the term was popularized by Martin Fowler. And it means that once, once we are satisfied with the state of our system or more like dissatisfied with the state of our system, we actually tear it down and recreate it with hopes that the new, the new configuration that we have, it converges and we have all the latest changes applied. 
However, however, if, if we continue with our practices of managing things manually, accessing services via SSH, sooner or later we'll revert to the state that, that we were in, 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 in pet, uh, pet servers. The, if we take this concept of immutable uh, servers to the extreme, so that's, that's the uh, upper, upper part of, of its evolution, it's immutable servers themselves, meaning that we created an image of a server, we know it's in known good state, everything, our fleet is in sync, it boots really fast, it doesn't depend on external repositories, which is, which is very important because if you try to manage your, let's say, auto-scaling group and uh, suddenly some, some repo is not available and the instance is trying to, to come up, bad things happen. However, if we go back to our properties that we talked about, repeatability, uh, statelessness, and disposability, immutable servers is not the only way to achieve uh, those desired properties. Such as nothing stops you from baking an EMI um, at, let's say, not, not, not complete, not full stack EMI, uh, and then still manage, uh, restrict the access uh, to, to humans, and then manage your configuration tools to configure those servers. You achieve the very same properties, but you do not go all the way to mutable servers. And if you look at, uh, at it, it's almost like a slider, how, how much you put into AMI versus how much, how much you configure, is that where you want to keep your com complexity. Such as you want to keep your configuration tools complex, then you go with, with con con configuring at, at boot time, if you want to, to push everything to, to baking and then maintaining the infrastructure of, uh, of AMIs, that, that brings another layer of complexity, so that is another uh, end of the spectrum. And there are, there are benefits and drawbacks to both approaches, not only complexity, but also with AMIs, you have costs associated with it. The AMIs, they, 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 they keep multiplying. And if you are talking about the immutable infrastructure, such as if you do something like red-black deployment, and then at some point in time, we'll have essentially two fleets of servers running simultaneously, which effectively doubles our cost. So we talked about this concept of repeatability. Now, what about statelessness? We would like to have this, this property and how we, how we achieve it. We achieve it by moving all the state of our servers, such as if we have logs, then use one of the partner solutions or one of the managed solutions or um, essentially one of, one of uh, self-managed solutions to just, for example, get all the logs of the instance. If possible, persist data on EBS volumes because EBS volumes can outlive the instance and we'll, we'll see an example of it. If it makes sense from the operational perspective, let's say if you have some kind of database why don't you move it to, to a managed server such as RDS or DynamoDB and make it someone else's problem? Just one less thing to, to worry about. And then uh, you can always maintain uh, a large data lake uh, inside Amazon S3. Since we talked about EMIs, uh, let's, let's quickly touch on uh, what kind of AMI uh, models exist so that we, we set the stage. At the, at the very bottom, we have uh, essentially base EMI, which doesn't have much, it just bear, bear, bear uh, operating system. Then we have foundational AMI, and foundational AMI is something where we preload packages, something that we need, something that is used uh, in, 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 our, uh, in our infrastructure across, across the board. And the, the final is the full stack AMI where we have everything except for the configuration that gets injected at the boot time. So where do we start? We see that actually many companies, you, there, is, there is a scale of how, how, how far you want to be in this AMI chain, and normally the process works like this. You start with, with a base AMI that doesn't change often. Base AMI is something that gets updated fairly, uh, not regularly. And then you produce actually a foundational AMI out of it. And this foundational EMI, it has the properties that it, it has all the packages that, that we need for our system, such as it, it meets our security baseline, it meets our best practices, it, it has all the provisioners, all the loggers, uh, everything that, that we need. And then if we want to stop here and then use our configuration tools to, to go up at the boot time, great. 
we can we can do it. So foundational AMI is is is, is a great place to be in. And then it, that that one gets gets updated a little bit, uh, not not a little bit, but more often than than base AMI. And the last one, if if we want to go with full stack, uh, having foundational AMI is actually much easier um, because you you essentially uh, produce uh, changes that that are essentially delta of your application and the uh, foundational AMI. Since we're talking uh, about AMIs, you can, you can do it by hand, but probably you don't want to do it at scale. There are tools out there that, that can help you with that, such as Netflix Eminator, and there is this whole uh, bakery associated with it, and as well as this tool, HashiCorp Packer, that has multiple baking, baking algorithms uh, for AMIs that, that it provides. There's actually another one that, that covers creation of EBS volumes, so, but it's a little bit out of scope. And if we talk about our AMI build pipeline, this picture, it looks rather generic, but it's actually very important. It's important in a way that, first of all, we see that developers, they interact with the system through the code repository and everything is abstracted by our CI CD pipeline. And you can implement it using various tools, such as you can, you can put Jenkins there. Uh, you, can, you can put, uh, let's say, Spinnaker there, or you can put uh, Code Pipeline. And Packer actually plays, plays really nicely with Jenkins because it supports um, environment variables and makes that integration very nice. So you don't have to hard code things, you can actually reference them. Then we also have something that is, that is AMI registry. That is important, and you need to maintain essentially the uh, sanity within, within your AMI. So you need, you need to have some, some kind of system to uh, maintain those images and make sense of them, just because you produce them uh, often. Such as if you go with full stack AMI, it means that you will have multiple, multiple images every time the application is built. If you go with foundational AMI, then uh, the number of them will be fewer. And one thing is, no matter where you stop, it's always a good idea to test your AMI once it's been baked. So that is, that, is, that, is, that is very important because at scale, you don't want to be troubleshooting things that, that were caused by, uh, by, by some, let's say, base update that, that you had and then you just didn't test for it, right? And the last piece is that once we have instances, it's a good idea to actually externalize the configuration and have some kind of configuration service to wire this, this instance up and get, get, get the parameters that it needs. So once we talked about the pipeline and testability, we want to make sure that our, uh, our instances, when they, when they boot up, they're actually happy. And there are several, several ways to keep them happy, such as we, we can use tools such uh, cloud init, uh, make use of it, such as some, some, some use cases. Maybe we need to, on, on the startup, format, uh, format disk and then make, make a raid out of it. Uh, configuration service. As, as, as we noted, there are many servers, and you want to make sure that you have some kind of like management system in place. Uh, Chef Puppet, service discovery, that is very important at scale. In my registry, you may look at uh, Netflix tools or uh, anything essentially where you can uh, query, describe image API that, uh, that Amazon Web Services provides. And Amazon, uh, that, that describe image API, is actually very powerful. Once you have this tagging policy in place, how you tag your images uh, by, by purpose, by um, What's, what's the operating system and such, you can actually narrow down uh, images fairly fast. And within the Packer, within, within the Packer tool, you can actually use that filtering mechanism. You can use that filtering mechanism to discover which AMI you should be using instead of hard coding AMI ID. And then instance metadata, very helpful. At the, at the boot time, you can, you can query it and see what, what um, availability zone you, you're coming up in. Um, and many, many other things. And then we talked about tagging. Please do tag uh, your instances and your AMIs because the more of them are there, like the more uh, complicated things, uh, the more complicated the management is. And tagging, uh, good tagging practices, that, that is the way to, to make sense of this system. So we talked about general concepts. We talked about general concepts that enable us to, to achieve this uh, 
the state of the system that scales as, as, uh, as long as uh, we, we need to maintain it and our organization grows and the infrastructure grows. But now I would like to invite Gene Stevens to actually take a deep dive and see how it looks in real life and how it was implemented at ProtectWise. Please. Thank you, Mikhail. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, we're going to pivot now into a very specific use case. We're going to show some really practical examples of how we execute on some of this. So what Mikhail really did is gave a, like the philosophical foundation. This is how AWS reasons about infrastructure and stateless infrastructure in particular. What we're going to do is show you how we lean into the EC2 infrastructural approach, take the stateless approach, put those two together, and simplify a lot of really big problems and high-scale problems. Um, so toward that end, let me actually talk to you guys a little bit about um, what ProtectWise is working on. We'll set the landscape, the kinds of problems we're uh, focused on, and uh, give you a sense for the kind of data and retention, the analytic windows, the, uh, uh, the kind of particularity that is required to do some really hard stuff and not have to work too hard at it. At the end of the day, ProtectWise, we are a startup. We're about three and a half years old, and um, we're still cutting our teeth. We're out there tackling a lot of stuff, and the short of it is, is that we have a small team that is working on some really big stuff. So, you know, more recently, myself and my co-founder, we got ProtectWise started. We were at Intel Security, and so we spent our time there getting a sense for some of the major challenges that large enterprises deal with. So in terms of creating an enterprise security platform, we are very much focused on these three challenges, and they have really big ramifications with regards to data retention and analytics, and I'll step into those here in a moment. The first thing that we are deeply passionate about is that given that advanced and targeted attacks in these organizations, they execute over really long periods of time. And this is a really interesting challenge for a lot of our infrastructure because we live in the moment, right? We say, we take what we have right now, we look at emails, we look at files, we look at packets, and we try to come to the conclusion, are they good or bad? But in security, the most interesting things have already happened. I mean, that's what's really top of mind. And so with that in mind, uh, our architecture is like really not well suited for that. So we thought to ourselves, gosh, if the median breach detection window isn't around eight to nine months, that's for the point of actual infection to the point of discovery, then we need an analytic window that goes like eight or nine months at least, right? So that we can actually have something that we can process and go back and find these things. That's a big challenge. Um, the second thing is that most of these organizations we work with would use like a bunch of different point products. Certainly the large enterprises, it's normal for people to have like 50 to 100 different security products and they're trying to pull them together and they have their Splunk, they have their SIM, they have other stuff collecting all those log files. They're purchased separately, they're managed differently, they're upgraded on a regular cycle. We thought to ourselves, gosh, if we could only get to that raw system of record that underlies all that detection, we could handle that breach window and we can handle that kind of analytic window from a threat detection perspective. That's interesting. So how can we help those teams then move away from simply operating their infrastructure and uh, move on to doing security? Well, that's a nice service idea, but the, the kind of work you have to do in processing, compute, and storage in order to make that happen gets really daunting really fast. And then at the end of the day, the biggest thing that I think all of us are really passionate about is the people who are involved in all of this. The biggest challenge we have in security is a resource challenge on humans, right? It's not enough professionals around, so how can we automate large portions of this, really compress that window, but also uh, accelerate and expand the resource pool, bringing the next generation of hackers and gamers and upskill them for an environment that many of the pros don't even understand very well. So the data ramifications for this got pretty intense. What we realized we needed to do is at the end of the day, we needed to do packet capture. And this is really the data set we're about to talk to you about. We do uh, packet capture at great scale. We give our clients um, a little lightweight software sensor. They deploy it anywhere. They can it inside their AWS, traditional data centers, all that type of stuff. Um, and they stream raw bits and bytes to the cloud in a real-time manner. So we have deployments that are measured now in data rates, a throughput of gigabits per second of data that's being shipped into AWS in order to do this kind of automated threat detection. 
that's pretty intimidating. In fact, as a, as, you know, as a guy who's getting this company off the ground in those earliest days, a lot of the people we talked to thought it wasn't even physically possible. So we thought to ourselves, oh, that may be, but if we figure it out, it's really going to be a big thing. So that was, that was a, a strong point of uh, motivation and engagement, but it also meant that we couldn't run away from a problem of needing to analyze that much data. And so if the breach detection window is really big, now how do I have packets and extracted metadata that I need to have laying around for a year? And this is not a cold storage problem. I don't, I don't put it in the glacier and in case I might need it later. We're actually going to go back in time and reanalyze and reconvict the past every time we learn about some new attack. So I'm, what I'm doing now is describing that this isn't just a bunch of tuples. These are tens of billions of transactions a day being ingested in a real-time manner, being stored and then hot analyzed a year later. So the amount of compute and uh, storage resources a traditional approach would have taken, like if we push this on to Hadoop and tried to deal with it later, it never would have worked. And so our our approach really began solidifying around this idea that if we could bring it together into a single haystack in the cloud, and this is a little view as to what we're, what we're doing, but you get a sense here that this is a live humming and thrumming system. It's an evented stream processing system. There's no batch processing happening here. And was running inside of this really large EC2 cluster. We're a big multi-tenant cloud security uh, company and it runs at line rate. So we have line rate distributed processing on systems where measuring time gets false fast because it changed by the time you're done measuring it, right? These kinds of systems pulled together, we realized that if we thought differently about our infrastructure, we would be able to create new technology that's really good at really hard problems, and I could take a very small team, and I'm about to introduce Robert here, who was the first person to cause this to actually operate correctly at scale, and, um, we're going to show you a little bit about how we were able to arrange it and tackle it and tamp it down to take some projects like growing a Cassandra cluster at this kind of scale, take weeks for the data to even rebalance. How do you get that done in like two to three hours instead? Because wouldn't you rather do that? And how do you remove side effects from your infrastructure? Because wouldn't you rather do that? Once you want to know for really large distributed systems that you have a test and load environment that behaves exactly like production so that as a startup or as a company with limited resources, you can actually have a small team very effectively Deploy, continuously deploy, continuously manage, and scale this thing up as the company grows and not actually really have to scale the team at the same rate at which you scale the business. That's really good. That's, that's a great way to make that work. So that said, what I'd like to do now is talk to you a little bit about how we think about our technology challenge. Really is very much basic startup stuff. At the end of the day, what you want to do, particularly in your innovation circles and that type of stuff, is you don't want to just build exactly what you think you need. You got to be good at building something that responds to your circumstances as they evolve, continuously evolve around you. We got to catch those curveballs, right? So we got to be really good at turning on a dime while moving petabytes of data in that direction at the same rate at which we are responding to the market. So rapid iteration, massive scale, like Netflix was our first paying customer, and that is a painful first customer, to be honest with you, data-wide. Hmm. Um, we were, you know, we needed to be really provider agnostic, so we were able to do this in uh, 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 AWS. In those early days, people, some people in the finance and healthcare industry like, hey, we're not going to the cloud. Now they're all like, help us get to the cloud, right? Um, and then we were able to uh, tackle, because we're a security company, how do you deploy patches to, to like a, a zillion servers and do it without creating side effects, right? We're not going to use Docker. We'll never be able to troubleshoot that thing. The amount of state and generational state that we would produce at scale, our team would never be able to stay on top of it. So that said, traditional microservice architectures, these types of things, what I want to do in the interest of time is to hand this over actually to Robert, who did so much of this code, so much of this infrastructure. We're going to show you specific things that we did, some specific use cases, and tackle those edges. Like the database means I have state in my infrastructure, right? Uh, if you think about it differently, you can even make your databases stateless, and you can grow them really, really fast without a lot of effort. So, Robert, thank you. It takes uh, the clicker. Oh, it's over there. Yeah. Cool. So, uh, according to Gartner, uh, errors in configuration and change management account for over 50% of outages. So, that's actually a significant motivation to improve these areas. That's uh, 
you know, we spend a lot of time debugging our code, making sure our code is well tested, but uh, sometimes we don't think about the configuration and change management aspect of it. Uh, additionally, the more complexity you have, uh, the longer your time to recovery. Uh, the more sources of uncertainty you have in your environment about your environment state, again, the longer time to recovery. So, uh, like Mikhail alluded to, the, uh, the traditional infrastructure way of doing things is to boot up a server, you know, install the base operating system on it, install all the packages that you need, uh, install your application, install configuration, uh, do that every time you need a new server. Uh, the result is that the new server has whatever packages were on it at that particular minute or whatever packages were current at the particular minute you booted it up. And then over the life cycle of the server, you continue to apply patches and configuration changes to it. And the end result is that the server, after a few weeks or months, if you were to boot up a new server and apply the same configuration, you don't get exactly the same server out of it because it doesn't have that change history. Uh, so the immutable programmable infrastructure way of doing things, you spin up a collection of servers. When you need a change, you spin up a whole new collection of servers rather than patching the old set. Uh, obviously, that means you want as much automation as possible. I mean, you know, if you're standing up 100 web servers, configuring them by hand, that's terrible. If you're doing that on every deploy, that's, that's really terrible. So that's not going to happen. Uh, programmability isn't specific to immutable infrastructure, but just as immutable objects make programs easier to reason about because you're not worrying about some thread elsewhere modifying your object and, and having to plan for that and protect against that. Uh, immutable, immutable infrastructure makes configuration management easier to reason about. You're not thinking about protecting yourself against what did the system been do to this server yesterday, we need to make sure we can, you know, we can handle that or, or whatever. It's you're, you're always applying it from a clean baseline. Uh, replacing the higher level resources, like entire fleets of servers, actually saves time over trying to debug an issue on a specific server, like try and figure out why the hard drive is slow or what happened, why the configuration has changed. You just throw it away, new server. Uh, so what we're aiming for is immutable infrastructure described with code. This uh, simplifies operation, makes configuration more consistent. Uh, Mikhail's talked about stateless services, that's particularly friendly to this approach. Uh, if your service itself is stateful, then you know, there's some state associated with it, and once you've spun up a new server, before you can throw away the old one, you have to get the state migrated over, or you have to drain the state and let the state accumulate elsewhere. So that's, stateless is definitely friendlier to this approach when you can do it. Uh, talking about specifically our use case, so as Gene mentioned, uh, we have prospective customers who are hesitant about cloud adoption, and particularly they're hesitant about shipping all their security data to the cloud. And so we want to make sure that we can support an on-prem model if we need to, or a hybrid model, but we really want to be in the cloud. We, we don't want to lose the benefits of being cloud native, like being able to scale out in minutes, uh, paying only for the resources we need, uh, being able to gradually roll out a new service into production without impacting production. Uh, we also want agility. Uh, we're a startup, you know, if an engineer or customer has a good idea, we want that proof of concept out into production in like minutes or hours, not days or weeks. Uh, we're a security provider, so we want to fix security vulnerabilities. I mean, everybody wants to, but I mean, particularly as a security provider, the last thing you want is to get owned by some well-published vulnerability. Um, but we have an additional sort of interesting context in that you know, Shellshock comes out or Heartbleed comes out, we want to patch Heartbleed, but then we also, at the same time, we want to be going back through our customers' last year of traffic to see if any of our customers were exploited by that vulnerability. So uh, we're not like, hey, stop the press, you know, we got to fix this vulnerability. It's fix this vulnerability and do a whole bunch of work at the same time. Um, I'm going to talk about testability here. Um, good tests are really crucial. I mean, this is something the, the agile developers already know. You know, they give you the confidence that it's safe to deploy your changes anytime, right away. Uh, if you don't have good tests, then you're reluctant to change, you're, you're looking for a change window to, to push those out, and meanwhile, the, the changes accumulate, and now you've got an even bigger set of changes that you're deploying in your change window, and you're even more scared to deploy it, it's kind of this downward spiral. So this, this applies to uh, infrastructure changes as well, not just code. 
Uh, so I want to talk about specific tool set that we use uh, at ProtectWise. So we use Chef for our per server configuration management. Uh, Puppet, Ansible, Salt are also typical options people use here that pretty similar. Uh, we have a base cookbook in Chef that's applied to every server and that's how we get our initial, you know, well audited, secure, the packages that we use on every single server are applied on every single instance. That's how we get from Ubuntu minimal to localized and audit ready, all the authentication, that sort of thing. Uh, and then obviously we have, you know, per, per service cookbooks that actually install the specific service that we want running on the server. Uh, importantly, each cookbook uh, bundles its own tests. Uh, we use mini tests for this. Uh, there's also server spec. Um, that's really crucial. Uh, they're, they're functional and acceptance tests that, that run at the end of the chef run uh, to validate that you got the expected result. So, you know, as a sort of straw man example, you know, if you had one cookbook that says, hey, we want to move SSH to port 1022 to be a little bit more obscure or whatever, and then somebody else has a cookbook that happens to set it to 2222, uh, you know, whoever wins the other guy's test at the end of the test run are going to fail and let us know that, hey, we've got something not working right. These two cookbooks conflicted with each other, and you're going to spot that before it gets to production. Uh, now, we run Chef every three minutes on every server. Now, that's, that's kind of a conscious trade-off. That's not the immutable infrastructure way. The immutable infrastructure way would be spin it up and then don't touch it and you're not allowed to touch it. But this is a little trade-off. We wanted the agility to be able to roll out a security patch or a hot fix or something in under three minutes. You know, at most it would take three minutes to get that out there. Um, but that's not how we want to maintain our fleet. That's just something we're doing so that we can get a, ha a hot fix out there quickly if we need it. Uh, so, stepping up a layer, we're using HashiCorp Packer uh, to create our, create our AMIs. Uh, you know, we don't want to start with a base image every time we boot a server, start with a base image, install the packages on every server every time. We want them all to be identical. So, Packer is what we're using to achieve that. Uh, if you guys are fam familiar with Docker, there's kind of a layered approach where you know, you apply a step and then you snapshot and then you apply another step and then you snapshot. And the bonus there is that those lower level steps, you know, install the operating system, configure this or, you know, whatever. You install your base layers, those things don't change as often. And so you don't have to repeat that work every single time you create a container. You're just, the, that last little bit of, oh, here, this little piece of code change, we're just changing that little bit. Well, we're using AMI, uh, AMIs as our container. We're using Packer to get basically that same layered approach. You know, we can, we can have a base foundational AMI that we like that we then just apply a, a code configuration change to very quickly. Uh, in Amazon, the Amazon EBS builder is the easiest one to use. Uh, the way it works is it, you, it boots up a node for you uh, using whatever base AMI you wanted. It applies your configuration management, shuts it down, snapshots the volume, creates an AMI out of it. Uh, that takes about like 15 minutes to run, uh, so it's not something that we want in our, in our fast path to production. We don't want to add a 15 minute step just to bake a new AMI on every single deploy, so we do this nightly. Uh, there's also the Amazon Shroot Builder. Uh, it's faster, all right? It starts with a running node. Uh, it takes an AMI, uh, builds an EBS volume out of it, mounts that EBS volume on the running image in a subdirectory, and then shroots into that subdirectory and applies the configuration management in the shrouded environment. Uh, because you're not booting up the instance, you're not shutting it down, it's much faster. It's five minutes or less uh, for us with a, with a pre-built base image. Um, you can also run it in parallel. If you have a beefy machine, you could do a bunch of those on the same machine. Uh, the docs say that you should start with the EBS builder, and they're absolutely right. Um, the Shroot builder has a lot of gotchas, and if you've started with the EBS builder, then you know your configuration management is working well. You know you're, you're getting a working image out of it. And then when you start running into these gotchas with the Shroot builder, you know, okay, yeah, it's, it's something to do with I'm running in the Shrouded environment. What, what do I need to change here? Uh, so between Chef and Packer, we have a system where 
we can have a well-tested base image that we know passes their security requirements. You know, we can, we can run our vulnerability scanner on that base image and make sure that all the current CVEs are covered. And we can also keep that up to date. We don't need to, you know, uh, again, Mikhail mentioned the, the golden image concept of you've got this foundational base AMI. Uh, you don't want to, you don't want to keep that around for six months before changing it because then you've got a pet AMI and all of a sudden there's a huge CVE out there and you've got to, you've got to remediate it and you have this big change set all that you're, you're pushing out all, all at once. You've got six months of changes to Ubuntu or CentOS, whatever it is you're using that you're pushing out all at once. Uh, so anyway, we can, we can treat our AMIs as immutable, uh, but we can also cheat here and roll out emergency fixes quickly. So this is an overview of the first part of a Packer file, uh, Packer configuration. Uh, again, we're using Chef. Uh, here we're using Chef Solo. Uh, just to decouple it from the Chef server. Uh, and the provisioners array is, these are the steps required to bring this, this container from the base to the desired goal. Uh, again, we're using Chef Solo, but it, it also supports Puppet or just shell scripts for that matter. Uh, and then the other piece of the Packer file is the builders array. Uh, this is what tells Packer what kind of image it's creating and, and what process to use to create it. Uh, you can swap in different builders into the same file to create VMware images, Docker containers, whatever you like. Uh, so that's really cloud agnostic, um, and that's really important for us uh, in knowing that we can create whatever kind of container you need. And uh, in fact, it's an array, uh, so that means that we could actually specify both a Docker container and an AMI here and get both, or a VMware image. Sorry, it's the desert. It is dry. All right, so moving one more level up. Uh, we're using HashiCorp Terraform. I, I don't work for HashiCorp. I just use half their products. Um, this <laughs> describes our entire environment. All right, so Chef gives us a server. Packer gives us a fleet of identical servers. Terraform is what glues that all together. Uh, specifies servers, VPCs, load balancers, security groups are all describing code. Uh, so this means we can stand up a new copy of an environment with one command. Um, just as we want all our servers to be identical, we want our staging environment uh, we have environments for specific large customers. We're building out in Japan, Europe, and South America regions, and we want those to be identical too. Uh, you know, I, we just had uh, two new DevOps guys come on, and for both of them, one of the things I did was have them stand up. Uh, for one of them, it was a demo environment. For one of them, it was replace our staging environment. Uh, you know, usually if you've got 50 microservices and three years of development, that's not something you could just throw the new, you know, through the, throw the new DevOps guy and say, hey, you know, for this week, stand up a copy of production for me. Uh, so that's, that's been really nice. Uh, this is an example of a Terraform configuration file. So it says you see resource AWS instance at the top, but this is actually plural. You see a couple lines down, you see the count. This is actually describing an entire Cassandra cluster. Uh, important to note, Pretty much everything in there is either a variable or a reference to another resource. Uh, that makes this portable across environments. Uh, it means that we're not copy pasting a security group ID into a bunch of different places in the file. That's very important. Uh, this is the least provider agnostic piece of our stack. Uh, you know, but basically since we're describing VPCs and security groups and things that don't exist in other environments that's sort of required. Um, all right, so one of the cool benefits that you get that, you know, I, we wanted to use Terraform just because we wanted to automate this environment creation, but something that, that we realized as, as we started looking at our, our audit posture is that this gives us a revision log for our infrastructure. You know, if you have compliance requirements, you probably need to know who's making changes, why they were made, who approved them, 
So you can use your regular code workflow for this instead of having a completely separate process for environmental changes like firewall rules. So this is a big win from an audit perspective. All right, so to sum up, we're using Chef for individual instances. We're using Packer for collections of instances. Uh, we're treating AMIs as mostly immutable containers and as building blocks for more complex containers. Uh, we're using Terraform for whole environments. So I mentioned testing earlier. I want to get back to testing again. Um, kind of a fundamental tenet of testing is that what you test is what you deploy, or maybe vice versa. You deploy what you test. Uh, you don't want to compile your code and test that, and then recompile it, package that, and then ship that and hope that it's identical to what compiled last time. You know, you want to test it as a package. Uh, so here we've moved from, you know, testing that package to testing the package on the AMI. You know, very Docker-like in you, you no longer have that, well, it worked on my machine kind of thing. You can see here is what it looks like in the AMI, and yeah, it works in the AMI. The library that it needs is installed in the AMI. But we're even going a step farther, and we're testing it in the entire environment. Uh, you know, you can test your AMI all day long, and like, yeah, web service looks like it's good, but if you put that on an instance that the security group won't let it reach the database, it's probably not gonna work. So this allows us to test the security groups as well as the AMIs, everything else all together. All right. Further on testing here, um, talk about gradual delivery. So I realize it's a meme kind of thing. You know, I don't always test, but when I test, I do in production. But you know, if, if you've ever operated anything at scale, you realize that there's no substitute for production traffic. Um, you know, no matter how thoroughly you test, the customers are going to do something to you that you didn't expect. Uh, additionally, our service looks like a pipeline. You know, we're, we're getting data in one side, and then it's processed through a bunch of steps, and then it's eventually persisted to the database. So we don't want to insert a new untested step in that pipeline and have everything downstream potentially break. Uh, so what you want if you've got a pipeline like this is you want a message bus. You want a message bus that provides PubSub architecture with fan out, and by that I mean you want to be able to have multiple consumers of the same message. Uh, if you have that, and that's, for us it's Kafka, but uh, if, you're, if you're Amazon native, Amazon Kinesis is the way to go here. Uh, what that allows you to do is you can deploy a new service or a new version of your service, have it consuming production traffic alongside the rest of your service, but have it either not publish at all, if you're just profiling it, or have it publish to another topic in Kafka or another stream in Kinesis, so that you can consume that stream by itself outside of production, validate that the output looks like what you expect. Uh, let the service run for however long, whether it's 60 seconds or 30 days, to confirm that it's stable and it's producing the output you expect. And then you just do a configuration change so it's publishing to whatever topic or stream does get persisted to your database or is now viewed by customers. Uh, so this has allowed us to save cost, save, save money, and uh, also make major architectural changes quickly. So I want to talk about both of those now. If I can get the clicker to work, yeah. So we persist over a billion business objects a day and we keep them for up to a year. So the database is a big, big deal to us. A lot of places go all in on the kind of stateless, immutable infrastructure approach, but they get, get to the database and they say, well, but the database is stateful, that's where the state is, so it can't be stateless, right? Like, I mean, you see that all the time. It's like, here, let's make our app all stateless and the database, oh, and now you've got a pet database. Uh, that's, I, I've done that a lot myself, uh, and it's, it's an easy trap to fall into. I was, I was sort of fortunate that we were so successful so rapidly. I, I couldn't have pet databases. They were, they were like, they were filling up really fast. Um, so the thing is that with the right database technology um, and a little bit help from EBS, you can actually, you can treat the database similarly. So we're using Datastax Enterprise which is Cassandra, uh, we're actually using the Cassandra piece plus the solar piece that are, that are tightly integrated together. It's, uh, it's highly parallel, highly scalable, highly available. We can lose an availability zone or we can shut an availability zone down uh, and keep on cooking. 
uh, the solar piece is what allows us to do arbitrary full text searches on the data. And then Cassandra is what gives us the high, high speed key value store. Uh, now, it's not all unicorns and rainbows. There's actually limits to Cassandra. Um, as an early example, we had a big fire drill when we hit 256 nodes. Um, that's since been fixed, but that taught us that uh, we can't just assume that it's going to scale infinitely. Um, so we sh you should shard your database whenever possible, or at least be have a strategy to be prepared to shard your database. For us, we have time series data, so we shard on time. Uh, that means we have one hot shard that's taking nearly all the current writes. Uh, it requires you know, tons of CPU to do indexing, tons of memory to do the searches, and very high speed I.O. Uh, we're using I22XLs for that today. Um, but then we have lots of warm shards with previous months of data on them, and those have a very different profile. They're taking very low volume writes where it's not completely changeless because we're going back through customer data and we're finding old threats from last month and writing them to those databases. But for the most part, they mostly just need RAM. They don't need a lot of cores. They definitely don't need like super high I.O. So when we roll a new shard, that means that the, the old data is now on an expensive database that, or an expensive hardware that it doesn't really need. Uh, so with Cassandra, like if you just read the docs, like the way that you're supposed to do this is you stand up a second data center, uh, you enable multi-directional replication, uh, you let the data stream over and re-index if it needs re-indexing, uh, you swing your rights over to the new data center, and then you stop replication, kill off the old data center. Uh, that works great. There's no downtime. The whole thing works great. We, we do it a lot. Um, and if your state's on disk, on ephemeral, uh, that's what you're going to have to do because your, your ephemeral storage is tightly coupled to your server. Uh, but for our warm shards, we're using M44XL with EBS, uh, and we're going to be probably doing this for our hot shards now soon as well uh, because that gives us some amazing advantages. Um, if EBS is your backend store, you've decoupled the state of the database from the server that's serving it. EBS is handling the state now. And if you have a fully replicated data store like Cassandra, you don't care if an individual server is up or not. You've got two more replicas. So as an example of what that gives you, uh, if we have a significant schema change, we may have to do a complete re-index of our data. Uh, with M44X large, that re-index uh, would take over a week. That's okay, but I mean, again, we want to be agile, so we actually want it to be able to complete more quickly. So we just, one availability zone at a time, we stop all the servers, convert them to M410XL, start them back up. When the whole thing is M410XL, we kick off the re-index, and then we reverse the process. So we've basically, we've taken a running database, and we've just added, we've almost tripled the CPU and the RAM while it was running just for the time that we needed it. So we're not paying for it constantly. Uh, the CFO wouldn't give me approval to just run these things indefinitely on beefy servers. Uh, so we can just, we can do that in real time. So that's been a lot of like really specific, you know, Packer, Chef, Cassandra, really specific tools. I kind of want to generalize that and give you some, some more general summary advice. Uh, we want to take the lessons that we learned from agile development and apply them from, to infrastructure. We want to build an environment where you can deliver small, well-tested changes very quickly. We want to maintain an environment that has as little variability, excuse me, as little variability and uh, as few external sources of confusion, like people coming in and reconfiguring your servers, as you can possibly get. We want to use immutability and statelessness as much as possible. Uh, question assumptions like the database can't be stateless. Um, sometimes it's, it requires a little extra work up front to get that last little bit of state off of the server, but we keep running into cases like that, that EBS you know, re-indexing thing where it's provided us benefits that we weren't even really planning on. Like that wasn't why I put them on M4s, but then I put them on M4s and I was like, oh, I don't actually need to like take this long to, to do the re-index. Um, and then your tools, like we're using Chef 
and Terraform that you want tools that provide item potency. So what, what item potency means is it's an operation that if you apply it more than once, you get the same result every time. Uh, so that Terraform file that described 25 Cassandra servers or however, you know, however many count was, um, that's not saying add 25 more servers. That's saying this cluster is supposed to have 25 servers, and if you run it and it doesn't get us to that known state. Uh, Chef is kind of the same way. It's, it's saying if you run and you see this package isn't here, get the package in there. Uh, you also want abstraction. Um, I, I got questioned at a, at a previous company, like, why are we using Chef and not just shell scripts? Like, can't we just, you know, this is an awful lot of complexity. Well, the nice thing is that Chef provides, and, and other tools, Puppet, do this as well, um, provides you an abstraction. So you're just saying, I want to install this package. I'm not running the apt command. I'm not running the yum command. I'm just installing a package. Uh, and it seems like a lot of work up front, but at the previous company, we had, a, we had an emergency. We, we needed to be on CentOS because the data center we were going to only had CentOS in it. And it took us, I, I don't know, I had budgeted a sprint for this, and I thought it was going to be a huge fire drill. And literally, like the next day, we were all sitting around going, it's, I think it's done. You know, so having that abstraction of being able to go from CentOS to Ubuntu or Ubuntu to CentOS, or you know, in the in the Packer sense, being able to go from an AMI to a VMware image is really powerful, and it can help you iterate more quickly and respond to changes or customer requests much more quickly. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass the mic back to uh, the virtual mic. Uh, yeah, so we're kind of at the end of the session here. Um, I want to leave some closing thoughts. I know some of you guys probably want to get to your next thing. Um, so really the, the, the goal here is to say if we just think a little bit differently about really large problem landscapes like this, um, we can really take a lot of really hard stuff and make it really manageable, really approachable so that real teams can be successful in a way that others are even confused as to what went wrong in the, in the process, right? And so ProtectWise is very much oriented around trying to deliver that same experience for our customers, but it really means that we have to be really good at operating it on the back end because also when you deal with like petabytes of data, that can get expensive. But if you change things differently, the cost of actually managing and computing, processing, moving stuff around gets really cheap, it gets really affordable, but it also, the most important bit, it keeps the team happy and keeps us sane and we're not, you know, pissing off customers because we lost control of our infrastructure in the middle of that, right? So with that in mind, I um, really want to invite you guys, if you're really interested in what we're working on specifically, we have a booth. It's uh, booth number 1845 in the Expo Hall. Stop by. We'll show you a little bit more about it, but if, you, if some of you want to hang out and ask some questions, we'll be happy to do that right now. So... I think there's actually a mic here if somebody wants to walk up and ask, ask a question. Just going to quietly well, go to the next session. That's good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.